So it looks like we are live. <laughs> <laughs> After a very yeah. annoying American lady's just come on and announced it. <laughs> Um, so hi everyone, uh, welcome to our first webinar of Really Moving um, about becoming a homeowner in 2021 um, with our special guest Kate. Um, we're just watching as people are joining so we're going to give everyone a couple of minutes just to sort themselves out. Um, so I will just do a bit of housekeeping while that's happening. So um, we are recording this webinar, we'll be sharing a copy with you um, at the end if you'd like it. Um, just to be aware that it is being recorded. You are all on mute. Um, if you'd like to share any questions, we hope that we will have a lot to answer. Um, but if you have got more that you'd like to share or that pop up during the um, webinar, just um, stick them in the chat box and I'll be able to share them with Kate and we'll either discuss them. If we can't cover them today, we will send you some answers. Um, and lastly, we will be putting some polls out in the chat box throughout, so please do answer. It really helps us to understand who you guys are, what you care about, um, and to help make hopefully future ones of these that are more useful for you. So, shall we get started? Yeah, why not? Why not? So... Right, so I'll start with who we are. Um, so my name is Andy, I'm the content marketing manager here at Really Moving. Um, despite the fact that I have written content for first time buyers, particularly over the last three years, um, I didn't really think the home ownership was possible for me. Um, and luckily I've proven myself wrong. Um, we are very lucky to be joined by Kate Faulkner, who is one of the UK's leading property experts. And if there is something about property that Kate doesn't know, um, it's really not worth knowing. <laughs> so I'm going to hand over to Kate. Thank you very much, Andy. Um, so what we're going to cover, so just to explain how uh, we've put all of this together, uh, you were kind enough to send in your questions. So what we have done between us is work through into um, all the different areas and just try to group them a little bit. Uh, so hopefully, all of the questions that you have asked should be answered um, at least in some way, shape or form. Um, although I have to give you a slight uh, question on that. I think I might have to fill in the poll because actually I don't, uh, uh, otherwise I can't see anything. Um, so, because <laughs> the presentation's disappeared at the moment on me, I'm just letting you know. Uh, so uh, what, um, what I have though uh, done at the start is not, necessarily covered one of the major questions that you've asked. However, uh, for me, understanding the market is the most important thing um, that I would do before I looked at anybody. I mean, we help people buy and sell, um, invest in property all over the country. So for me, um, I've added this in, which I hope you don't mind, um, and I'd love your feedback on it, because if you don't first understand what's happening in your local property market, it's very, it, it's almost like you're trying to buy and sell in a fog. So that's that's how it is in my mind. So the first important thing to understand is please, please just ignore all the media headlines. And especially, although my life is ruled by averages when it comes to the statistics that I work with, you, when you're buying for yourself, can just absolutely ignore them. And I've tried to kind of pull together some, some stats to explain why, and particularly when it comes to you worrying whether you can afford to buy a property. So if you take the average uh, London uh, house price that you'll be told is, oh, this is over half a million, it's 514,000, you haven't got a hope. Um, this is basically made up of an average of two figures. And one of them is for, a lot lower because the average price a first time buyer pays isn't 514,000. It's still a lot of money. It's still 445,000. But actually, those people that are buying, taking second steps or even trading down are paying a lot more than that 514,000. And having done analysis uh, and work with agents um, on the 32 London boroughs, I can guarantee you can pretty much, not huge numbers of them, but pretty much in every single borough, even in sort of Kensington and Chelsea, you will be able to find a property for around 300,000. After saying Kensington and Chelsea, it isn't much bigger 
than a broom cupboard, but it is possible. And it just throws that kind of half a million as an average and making you and and working out for you or indeed your, your friends or other members of the family. You don't have to worry about those averages because I picked up this this great little property um, and this is um, near Enfield. Uh, it's a shared ownership property and you're talking at buying it for 10 times less than the average house price in London. So, yes, you don't own the whole place. Um, it's a 25% share, but you can buy it for just under 54,000. And therefore, if you're listening to the media and you're not doing the work for you, you wouldn't know that if you were on 22 and a half thousand pounds, you could actually afford to buy to buy a share in this property. And I'm sure as you work through the numbers, you know, you hear all these terrible things about deposits, and we'll talk about that and how much you need. But you're talking about a deposit of around two and a half grand. It's still a lot of money, I know. Um, but if there's two of you, at halves of course um and your monthly costs are estimated at just under 900 pounds plus you, you will have your council tax and you will have other bills but that's probably less than you would have to pay um in rent um on this occasion so just ignore those big property market headlines and certainly don't let them influence you or anybody you know as to whether you can or can't afford a property. So if we pop on to the next inciting instalment, um, this, is, uh, this isn't meant to tell you what's happening around the market or anything. It's just what I want to show you with this is that for me, I've worked with property prices for a long time. And I can pretty much guarantee, even in today's market, which is kind of flying at this moment in time, there will be prices across the country that will be going up, down and stay the same. And I did um, a, a piece for the BBC. We had a prop, we had properties on a road in Peterborough. It was quite a big road, I'm going to confess. And it was about, but in a mile, we found properties that were worth a lot more than they were 10 years ago, stayed exactly the same price and had fallen in price as well. So again, these averages hide lots of things. But you can see here that there is a vast difference in performance of um, house prices. And in London, you can see there's your half a million um, average. Prices have gone up a lot. They've gone up by about 72% since the last peak in the market, which was before the last crash. They're going up by 10% year on year. But on average, over time, during highs and lows, they go up about 5% um, every year. But you go to somewhere like the Northeast, the Northeast house prices haven't changed for nearly 14 years. That's 14 years. So if you're in the Northeast, there is no, your actual affordability has got a lot better. And yes, they're having a big year now. So again, you'll hear lots about house prices going up by seven or eight percent. Well, actually, big, no big deal in the Northeast because they're still the same price as they were on average. 14 years ago. So it's really important that you get a handle on these statistics of what's happening in your local area, because actually you'll find that in some places they'll be a lot more affordable than you'll be um, getting told by, particularly by um, the newspapers. So I hope that's kind of uh, helpful. And then I think the next one sort of starts to address more of the questions you ask. And I have to say, so we've had some fabulous questions, haven't we, Andy, um, which are it's really, really covered a lot um i think you were going to mention scotland briefly i was because i think we have a scottish contingent thank you for reminding me <laughs> um so basically scotland has followed pretty much the northwest pattern so there you've got an increase of around 18 percent scotland's around 14 percent so a little bit lower um but almost on a par very similar year on year, slightly uh, higher. It's about 2.9% increase on average uh, back to 2005. So that's if you take the average price now, take it away from the average price in 2005. House prices have gone up um, in Scotland around 2.9% each one. So uh, yes, oh, yeah. so you're absolutely right. And we do do all of this data every single month. So you can access this completely free of charge. Um, so it's all there for you to go and have a little look at and then drill down into your particular road or road that you're looking at because they could be completely different to any of these figures so really important to, to know what's going on um oh no no we've got another poll that's exciting yeah so i have just asked because you said it was so important um you know i thought we see have people been thinking about their local area do they know what prices look like do they know the variety um and, and how much that changes yeah, that would be. That I have to say that'd be particularly interesting for me because I'm obsessed about it. But you might, <laughs> you might just think I'm bonkers and I'm just, a, I don't know what I'm talking about, which is perfectly okay. I, I, kind of, I, I do, I do understand that. That's fine. I'm always willing to learn. 
So when can we move on to the next slide? So I will just close our poll now. Um, and I'll share guessing. that it's a uh, 74% have, have thought wow. about their local I'm area. So well impressed. That's really good actually. But for those of you that haven't, that is where that is that is the first place to start. And actually, you'll probably be quite uh, some sort of happily surprised if you like, like I hope everybody else was. So be keen to hear your feedback on that. So some of the questions were around, well, Kate, how do I kind of work out where to live? And particularly if you're in a city like Birmingham or uh, Leicester or, or London or Edinburgh, wherever you might be. Um, I used to do a lot of work with relocation. Uh, so if people were being moved from one area to the another, um, it was great. I got paid to move people. It was fabulous. Um, and one of the first things we used to sit down and talk about was look how long are you willing or able to commute to the various different things that you do in your life is it 30 minutes because you just hate being in the car or hate being on a tube is it an hour or especially in today's world maybe it's more so I live uh, near a place in uh, east of Nottingham and I do quite a lot of work in London and that's a couple of hours away um, or about what well, it's about an hour and a half uh, into King's Cross. So um, I don't have to go there every day, though. Um, don't have to go there at all for the last 12 months. It's been lovely. Uh, so, uh, but now, you know, just if I moved out here because I knew I'd only be having two, I'd usually have two long uh, commute days or I'd stay over. And think about your regular places that you'd work. So where you go to work, how are you going to get to work? Um, is it a safe trip home at night if you have a night out? Where are your family and friends that you go and see regularly? And then the other thing um, that's worth thinking about is you might, for example, you might be into sailing, hockey. hockey I used to play when I was fit and healthy um, or go to the gym or whatever. <laughs> Don't forget that you can always add those in on your way home. Uh, so if you've got a particular gym that you like and they're a chain, you could have a look at your work and look to see actually and choose. If you go to the gym every night, you want to choose somewhere whereby you might not be able to afford where that gym is on the way uh, you know, to live nearby. But you might be able to afford to drop, sort of go two or three stops down the line, jump off, go to the gym and then head home. So that's another little way um, of looking at it. And of course, the all important amenities when we're all allowed out again. Um, uh, no, so park is the only thing I think we can go to at the moment. So I hope that kind of helps in terms of choosing an area. And then I've kind of chosen on the next slide. Um, I grew up, so the one on the right where it says West Bridgeford, I grew up in West Bridgeford um, as a kid. And uh, it never was a really expensive area, but it is. It's south of uh, Nottingham, uh, south of the river in Nottingham now. And it's a really expensive area. And it has some really beautiful um, properties, absolutely beautiful. So if you're there and if you're sort of determined to buy in West Bridgeford or you love the property stock there, you're talking about for sort of two bed property at nearly 200,000 pounds. Um, but there's an amazing place, uh, which I prefer to be honest these days, <laughs> I say that about my, my homegrown town. Um, but if you go north of Nottingham, which is typically cheaper, there is a fantastic place called Sherwood and it's really up and coming and uh, it's got a lovely local feel to it. And interestingly, very, very similar stock to housing stock and types of properties to the ones that you have in West Bridgeford, but almost half the price. But it's exactly <laughs> the same distance from Nottingham itself and it is a lot cheaper because it hasn't got the expensive houses, uh, some of the expensive places that you have in, in West Bridgeford now. Um, so there will be pretty much in every city centre, there will be a good value area. Or the other trick that I've done before is I've bought on the edge of a good area. So for Londoners, for example, um, I bought just just in Acton, which is near the South Circular, opposite Gunnersbury Park on the border of Ealing and Chiswick. I couldn't afford Ealing, I couldn't afford Chiswick, but do you know what? I could afford a place in Acton um, and I still went to Chiswick and Ealing, so it made no difference. So that's the way that you kind of, if you need something a little bit of better value, that's the, that's the place to go. Um, so I hope that's kind of helpful in looking at sort of the locations um, and thinking about if you've got a choice, if you like, of where to live, how to, how to work that through. So on to the next one. So affordability. So the two biggest sets of questions we've got were affordability and uh, on mortgages. So we'll cover those. And I don't think affordability is particularly as scary as you think. The thing that winds me up about deposits is that, again, it goes back to those averages, those dangerous statistics that are chucked around in the media. And what you're often told is that you must have 20 percent deposit. 
That is total rubbish in actual mm -hmm. fact. What it's actually saying is that on average, people are putting down a 20% deposit for their first time purchase. And a lot of that it comes from bank and mum and dad. But if you haven't got a bank and mum and dad, it doesn't necessarily matter. And I'm actually a big fan of buying a property with a 5% deposit. And I've tried to explain this why. I hope it works, but shout if it doesn't make uh, any sense. So we're going to pretend that I'm the person on the left. So uh, I'm buying the hundred thousand uh, pound property, and I'm buying it with a five percent deposit, and I kind of scrimped and saved, and I've got my seven and a half thousand pounds. Andy, however, is uh, much more diligent than myself, <laughs> and she's going to buy same price property but she's managed to save 27 and a half thousand pounds. So she's got 25 percent deposit. And the point that we're trying to make with this is however much money you put into a property, if it grows in value and the predictions are, and again, this is an average, so some will do more, some will do less. If property prices grow over the next five years by 15 percent, that property is still only going to be worth 115,000, whether you put nearly 30,000 pounds in or whether you just put in seven and a half thousand pounds. So if you're thinking sort of making money out of property, if you've gone to the next one, what it will show you is that the seven and a half grand that I put into that property, because I've been paying my mortgage off for five years, I, when I sell that property, and I haven't included buying and selling costs, but we just want to kind of show you the principle here. I will net in my back pocket. So I put seven and a half grand in this ATM machine that is a hundred grand property. And when I sell it, I'll get 26 and a half grand out. And that is 350% increase on my cash that I put in. And that's because of the mortgage. And we'll chat through that in a minute. Whereas the growth on the physical cash that Andy spent all her time saving is just 67 percent. Now, you're absolutely right, because uh, any sensible person would go, well, yeah, but the mortgage payments, Kate, and you're right, I would have paid more in mortgage payments. And it's around seven grand over that five year period. And typically when people say you should have a 10 percent deposit, they then quote that you'll save seven and a half grand or whatever it is, or seven grand over five years. However, what they ignore is that because I've only got to save seven and a half grand, if I get on the property ladder in year one, and if prices rise, and Andy doesn't get on the ladder till year three or four, she's potentially missed out on equity growth. And that's what the people that are talking about higher deposit don't consider. Now, there is a word of warning that I have to put down. This works when prices are rising and they don't always rise. So let me explain on the next slide what happens or, or my thoughts on if prices fall, because I know that's something that um, first time buyers are already worried about. And I don't know, Andy, did you worry about that when you were buying? Did you have any concerns prices would fall? What was your? Actually, we weren't particularly worried just because we knew, I mean, we'd been in a similar situation where we'd been saving for a long time. And, you know, every time you save, you think you're never going to get there because the price has increased and you just think you're waiting and waiting and waiting. Um, but we knew we were moving into a home that we were happy to stay for more than five years. So in our heads, we were saying, well, five years is a long enough time to sort of, you know, you paid off a bit. If it does drop, it'll probably even out roughly. I think if we've been maybe moving somewhere for a couple of years, we might have felt differently, but we kind of felt like we're going to be here a while. We can probably weather the storm if there is a yeah. storm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that's a really sensible way of looking at it, because if you think about it, if you hadn't bought, what would you be doing instead? You'd either be paying a cost out in rent rather than paying off your repayment mortgage, or you'd still be living with parents, which might be a joy. It might not be a joy. <laughs> um, having done that several times in the past myself, it, it wasn't always <laughs> Um, and as long as you can still pay the mortgage, it's still providing a roof over your head. And you are going to need a roof over your head, whether that property grows in value or not. And the final thing is you can insure against mortgage uh, payments. You might struggle with job losses at the moment because of COVID, but you can certainly insure against things like illness. So it's really, um, if you think about it, the only disaster is if prices fall is if you're forced to sell. 
And there's ways to make sure that you don't necessarily have to sell. So, for example, if you'd bought a new build and you're allowed to let that new build, you can't under help to buy, but you could under other schemes, or you might be able to rent a room, for example, instead, that would enable you to hang on to that property. So my view is buy when it suits you and don't worry about necessarily you can't we can't predict the market we're really rubbish at it so that's <laughs> what's important the downsides because it's important for me to explain those is you're probably what people will say to me say, oh yeah okay but i'll grab if, if prices fall i'll grab a property that's cheaper well not necessarily because all those people that thought in April lockdown who were ready and have got their 5% deposit ready in April um, and were getting all these reports, prices are going to fall by 15%. We go, woohoo, this is great. Yeah. We're going to buy and prices are going to crash. Well, not only did they not crash, they went in the opposite direction. But because of the prediction that they were going to crash, there, were, there was no, and it's still very hard to get any 95% lending now. If you split up with your partner, if you lose your job, you then end up not being able to uh, purchase. So you've got to kind of think of this of, of, of buying. It's more about buying when the time suits you financially, not necessarily trying to time in and out the market, because I promise you that is a really, really tough thing to do. And we kind of don't know till two or three years later kind of what 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 was the best decision to have. So I hope that's kind of helpful just looking at that deposit. If you've got more deposit, great. But don't obsess about having a 10% or a 20% deposit, um, because as long as your income multiple will work, then it is possible um, uh, to purchase with a lower deposit. And um, if you put the right checks and balances in place, you're not putting yourself at too much risk. It so, does seem like you sort of suggested as well, which I think is important, almost taking the approach of an investor to an extent in the looking at how much you're putting in and what you're expecting it to get out of it, but then also focusing on the fact that you're buying a home. So yeah. whilst you want to be aware of how much you're putting in, you know, you I think you said before, if, if you were an investor, the idea would be to put in the minimal amount to get the most growth. So um, it almost seems silly to put off so much time um, desperately hoping for a deposit. But I think a lot of people and myself included believe that's the only way you're going to get a mortgage is if you've got a huge deposit um, yeah and it and it isn't and we know we'll talk, chat about that won't we with mm -hmm. some of the schemes that we've got available so don't think a five percent deposit is this sort of awful thing and you you if you that's all you can raise that's that's okay um that's that's kind of the message i was just going to launch a very quick poll so i'm just going to do that now about where you're currently living um so obviously if you are trying to save for a deposit it might be that you're living with parents um, in order to save that money or maybe save a bit of rent um, if they're very kind um, or it might be that you're renting and part of that is trying to save that money whilst you're renting um, can be a struggle so we're mainly asking this so that we can offer um, future advice that's sort of relevant to you so I'll just uh, give it a couple more seconds Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, and I'll just share that because it's quite interesting to see the cut. Um, okay, that's, that's really account. interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I feel like saying hello to your mum and dad, but I also feel like <laughs> awfully cheesy as well. So uh, I'll cover both bases with that comment. <laughs> so securing a mortgage. Do you know what? I was really surprised at how many questions and I kind of I've looked at research before and how worried people are um, when it comes to the mortgage. And I Andy and I had a few chats about this and I had a long think about it. And my conclusion really is don't worry about it. It's not your responsibility to decide what is the right mortgage for you. Um, if we go on to the next slide, I'll kind of explain that a little bit more. Um, you just use a broker. That's what I do. I'd never dream, I'd never dream um, of choosing a mortgage by myself at all. I really wouldn't. Um, and the reason is, is a mortgage broker, they are qualified. They're qualified in finance and they are regulated. So they have to give you advice um, that has been carefully thought through to try and make sure that they choose the right 
mortgage for you based on lots and lots and lots and lots of uh, clever people's experience. <laughs> and the thing that I've learned over the years is, oh, my word, lenders just have all their own sets of rules. So it is impossible. You've got um, I used to have, I bought a house and there was um, it was a 1930s house. And actually, no, sorry, I bought it was split into two flats. And a lot of lenders won't lend on flats that have converted houses. Some of them won't lend on flats that are above four storeys. Uh, some of them won't lend on a certain lease, lease length. So if you're buying a flat and the length is less than 80 years, some lenders won't lend on that. Um, there's lots of reasons we can go into that. So they all have their own set of rules. They have their own set of rules as whether they like people who are self-employed. Whether if you've got a job and you have a big set of commission, some won't take that into consideration and some will. Some will support you if you've got bad credit, some won't. And some will support government schemes and some don't. So bearing in mind you're talking about nearly 100 lenders out there, um, do you really, you just couldn't do it. It's like this is their day job. Why worry about it? Um, and by law, they have to ask you all the questions they need to identify the right mortgage they can for you. And certainly over, um, well, over the last few years, mortgage, new mortgage products come out pretty much every three months. But in the last 12 months, what we've actually seen, or certainly since um, June time, is some of the lenders will just put out a small amount of money um, and a small deal, uh, a good deal, and it'll only be available for two days. <laughs> and you haven't got a hope. Um, of trying to grab that or you'd just be really really lucky so as far as choosing a mortgage is concerned I wouldn't even really read that much about it sorry Andy you've probably written loads about it <laughs> <laughs> but I would just genuinely find a good broker uh, and find somebody that's going to look after you and just to explain that in a bit more uh, detail on the next slide um you can contact them as early as you like. We, we were listening, myself, uh, Andy and, and uh, Louise at Really Moving, we were listening to a Radio 4 programme for first-time buyers. It was on a, a money programme. And people were like, what do you mean I can call a year in advance or whatever? And one of the stories was, and the reason why you can call brokers early to talk to them about you want to buy a home and you want it to be in three and five years time and why that's okay is there was a girl on there that didn't realize she had just moved very brave in April she just decided to go freelance if she had picked up the phone to a broker the broker would have said to her if you want to buy a home just hold off going freelance for another 12 two years 12 months two years because it's much, much more difficult because you're going to need two years, typically two years worth of accounts. So the brokers want to hear from you. I have to say at the moment it's a bit of a nightmare because they're all heading towards the 31st of March deadline. But typically you can talk to the earlier you talk to a broker and get a plan of buying a home, the better. Um, and they'll only charge you once you actually physically take out that mortgage. So they are really good people to turn to and the first people to turn to. And just don't worry about all the complications of a mortgage because that's what their job is to do on your behalf. And the checks that you make, they do charge different fees and you charge them differently uh, when you pay, et cetera. So find that out. I, if you can try and find someone local, not as, not as relevant now because they we are home moving is really rubbish at digitalization so we are getting a lot better i have to say but we're still a bit rubbish so i always find if you can choose local people you can hand paperwork to like within 24 hours and not rely on the post which has been a bit rubbish um great and one thing i get really surprised at is that i always look for a company that's won awards and you know or has uh, been praised by which or whatever it might be and the reason being is the companies that care about their business will apply for awards awards so for me they're a big differentiator and not something that maybe you thought of but they are really and the good ones they apply because they want to reward their staff often and that's a that's a pretty nice company uh, that does that and the beauty is is once you've found a good broker you can use them for life and you don't have to go and start from scratch every time you want to remortgage or every time you want to go a new home. There's somebody really you need by your side through your 60, 70 years of home ownership. So that's definitely the kind of relationship and the, and the, that I would be looking about. So a lot of the complications of uh, mortgages aren't for you to worry about. That That's their job to do. Ask 110 questions, but it's their job to answer them. 
um, based on your personal circumstances, not somebody else's, um, based on some of the Facebook questions I've seen. <laughs> um, so don't rely on the answers to those, for goodness sake. Um, yeah. So I hope, I hope that takes a bit of the, the, the stress and worry of the mortgage away. I was going to say as well, I absolutely didn't know that when I sort of started the whole process and my broker was so incredibly helpful to the point where they were the person answering my questions throughout the process. And yeah, it's it's not in their interest to try and sell you something that isn't going to work for you or, they, you know, the whole point. And he used to send me these big reports on we discussed this and I suggested this and this is why I suggested it. And, you know, justifying all of the choices so you knew that you'd been listened to. Um, and yeah, that I can I can go back when I need to remortgage and I haven't got to find someone else um, or pay uh, my my fee included, you know, <laughs> that for life. So right, wow, that's good. A yeah. nice surprise. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, sometimes you do get good deals in this marketplace. <laughs> Not everybody just takes your money and run. Um, so <laughs> no, it is it is so as far as the mortgage side of things, that's definitely for a broker to worry about. You're there to ask all the questions. Choose the right one. Choose one you get on with, and choose one that. Um, can stay with you for life so you don't have to keep fill, filling in all the different forms etc so um i hope yeah. that's uh, that's helpful on that um trying to think what we've got next <laughs> oh buying costs that's it so you had a lot of questions on buying costs so i'm going to hand over to andy now because you've you've really moved has got some cracking stuff on buying costs haven't you yeah so we know that obviously the costs are the main you know obviously the cost of buying a home <laughs> Um, and the deposit and all of those costs people are concerned about, but the actual cost of moving. So we do an assessment every year that looks at the cost of moving, how it's changed up and down. Um, we've also got our moving cost calculator, which is a really brilliant tool that you can put in details about your move. Um, and we can give you a rough breakdown of all the different things and what it will cost. So we do really focus on a lot of articles. Um, as you can see, our conveyancing fees one is one of our most helpful um, and we update them to include the year. So. Um, you know, do have a look on the site. We will be sending um, a PDF round with a lot of resources and links to our different calculators and timelines and all sorts of great stuff we've got to help. So I really would hate for anyone to feel that it's the extra cost that would put them off. I know there's already the concern about the deposit, which hopefully we've put you a little bit at ease there. Um, so, I mean, and obviously our job, as well as helping all of you and answering questions and making the moving process easier, is to provide you with quotes so that you can find competitive costs for things so that is yeah. you know a big part of our job so um yeah and I, I like um, it because it's regional so you can get regional yeah. costs which I hadn't realized uh, before we started working together which is really mm -hmm. good um as far as the other things are concerned it is there was a great question actually uh, which most people don't ask and I'm so glad you've asked it about um when do I have to pay everything so typically you don't as a buyer have to pay anything until you've made an offer and that offer's been accepted. And then when that offer is accepted, the agent or developer, whoever it is, will write out to you. And at that time, they will want to know who your legal company is. So I always get you, my legal company sorted before I make an offer. So that's another little tip just to save you a bit of time. And when that happens and when you appoint the legal company, usually they will ask you to pay an amount up front for things like searches, which is something around £250. Um, next will be a cost of your survey and you usually pay that prior to a visit. So that probably be two or three weeks in after your offer. And then you, once your broker's decided on which mortgage is right for you, you might have a reservation agreement, broking, there's booking fees, all sorts of different things that they call it. Um, and here's my big bugbear your deposit. You must have your deposit physically in the solicitor's bank account or conveyance's bank account before you can exchange. Now, the reason that's so important is I don't know how many times people that are buying from me haven't done that and then they have kindly gone on holiday. Please don't ever <laughs> go on holiday when you are moving. Don't look at booking for a year. Please just don't do it. Obviously, you can't. It's legal at the moment. Um, so it's really important. That's one of the most important things to understand. Um, and then on or just after completion, you'll pay the legal fees um, and stamp duty. You actually have 14 days to file the paperwork and pay post completion. But it's better to get it all done in one uh, day. Also, one of the other things I thought, just in case you were buying a flat, is do check how the service and ground rent charges are going to be paid and the date, because that can catch you out. That could be seven or eight hundred pounds or something like that that you're not expecting. And it's because it's pro rated for the amount of time that you're buying that property during the month. So 
do check that as well. That's a little hidden cost that uh, might appear that you're not expecting. Um, I um, don't know if there's anything I've missed on there, Andy, or if that works. Oh, no, just um, so we do have um, different articles and stuff on leasehold and freehold and what the difference is around those, some of those charges that come with that. I wasn't sure if you just wanted to explain the difference between exchange and completion. Yeah, sure. So exchange is a happy day when uh, basically metaphorically the uh, contracts that you sign have exchanged and everybody's agreed that you are going to go ahead with the purchase and the, the people you're buying off are going ahead with the sale. And after that, as soon as that exchange date is set, you're, you're, you can pretty much guarantee you're going to get the keys. So and then what happens typically around two weeks later is that you will do completion. So the exchanges, you've agreed everything and you're definitely going to buy this property. They're definitely going to sell it to you. And then two weeks later, it's the actual all the things that have needed to be done um, are done, including getting the mortgage monies, etc. Um, and that's the completion days when you can pick up the keys. How's that, How's that work? Yeah, that's great stuff. <laughs> right. So next, government help. So I'll whiz through some of these because um, uh, they are quite complicated and it is worth taking um, individual advice uh, from the various different uh, organisations that offer these. So um, the problem with the government schemes is if there's a bad story, it'll hit the deadline, it hit the headlines. And unfortunately, all the good news stories never hit the headlines, because why would anybody be interested in good news property stories? Um, there are people who've done very well out of shared ownership. And there's a lot of people, particularly those that got in on the ground floor, have done very, very well out of um, helped by as well. So um, just very quickly, uh, shared ownership has been going around 40 years, would you believe? So you can buy a new build or you can buy an existing one. Um, you can typically they're not freehold, so they are leasehold. And I'll uh, leave Andy's uh, hard work to explain <laughs> that in a little bit more detail. Um, you don't necessarily get incentives, but you can. You don't have to buy the whole property. So you typically buy anything from 25 percent. Some schemes will insist on 50 percent. So it's just uh, worth having a little look at that. And as far as shared ownership is concerned, um, I think it's really great if you've got to be in a particular area because you need childcare or you've got to get to your nurse and you've got to get to a hospital at four in the morning or something for a shift change, then um, it's much it's a better tenure, I think, than renting privately. Um, but it is important to know it will typically cost you slightly more, which people are surprised about. Um, and we can sort of explain that at a later date or later on if we've got some time. Um, you are restricted on who to sell to. Um, and you have to get things like valuations, which you wouldn't do normally. Um, so there are some additional costs when selling. So the important thing is in any scheme like this is understand what it's going to cost you to get in and understand what it's going to cost you to get out um, and how long that's going to take. Very important questions to answer. The help to buy equity loan that's only available on new build, um, whether it's freehold or leasehold depends on the development. Um, and the government basically gives you 20 percent. Um, of the value of the property on an interest free loan um, for up to five years and then it ratchets up after that. So one of the best things about this is even if you've only got a 5% deposit, because the government's handing over 20% to the developer, you get access to 75% mortgage uh, rates, loans to value as we call it, and those rates tend to be pretty um, good. So that gives you a really good sort of five year, first five years to be able to put some money away potentially when you've moved in. Um, you are charged on the loan. So again, you need to understand what the cost will be after five years when you do that. And when you pay back, say, for example, we had a, bought a hundred grand property, slightly unlikely on help to buy, um, and the government had given you twenty thousand pounds. So they 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 they're um, twenty percent. If that property increased to one hundred and twenty thousand pounds, then you would pay back twenty two. I think if I've done that correctly. So you'd pay you'd pay back sorry twenty four thousand pounds. So you pay back twenty percent of the hundred and twenty thousand, not the original 20 grand loan so that's uh, but it's one of the ways they make it work the other thing you have to bear in mind it's a new build so you might actually be paying a 10 percent premium um, to purchase the new build rather than existing home so that's the that's the schemes they can be trusted but you must understand the cost in cost after the five-year loan and the cost out because they will be more drawn out than if you buy a property without doing one of these schemes. Now, again, um, unfortunately, we have policies which are different in Scotland and in Wales. <laughs> Everybody loves to compete. So I'm conscious of time here. So I'm going to rattle through these quite quickly. Um, so uh, in Scotland, you've got something called the First Home Fund, very similar, to be honest, to the Help to Buy scheme, except for the fact this extends to second home as well. It's not just on new build. 
And then there's two other schemes where they have a shared equity scheme, which is a, which you can only do from council or housing association, but you have to buy a higher amount. So it's a bit like shared ownership, um, uh, but you don't have to pay rent on the rest is the um, is the benefit. Um, but there aren't of these new builds. I don't think there's that many schemes. So there's not that much choice. Whereas the second uh, scheme they've got on the next slide. Uh, that allows you to buy pretty much um, anything. Um, the one thing, though, that's important to understand is, and it's less so on things like help to buy, more so on shared ownership in England, is that you have to prove that you can't afford to buy other properties. So help to buy has definitely gone to people that could have afforded the property potentially without the loan, uh, whereas you, you won't manage to do that in Scotland. And if we just run on to the next one in Wales, <laughs> That's pretty much the same. So they've got helped by uh, the official scheme ends in March 20, the end of this uh, end of next month. But there is a new scheme coming through um, similar to Scotland. They have a home buy scheme so you can buy 70 percent uh, of the property and they will help with the rest and you don't have to pay rent. They do have a very interesting rent to own. Unfortunately, it hasn't sort of caught on in many other places. So if you're if you're in Wales and you're not in a position to save for a deposit now, you can rent. They will put that the 25 percent of the rent towards it. And if the property increases in value over the time period that you rent, they will also put the increase in value. 50 percent of it will go towards your deposits. So um, that's oh. quite a neat scheme. But um, mm -hmm. please don't think there's thousands of those available and you should all run off to Wales. I'm afraid that's going to happen. <laughs> uh, so um, apologies for that and uh, uh, dangling a large carrot in front of you. <laughs> I was just going to say as well, I think it does depend on perspective. I had quite um, limited views on shared ownership when we first looked at it. I sort of dismissed it as it's not good, as good as buying and it's not real buying and all these kind of things that I think because you read the bad headlines. Um, but the way that I've started to look at it is like renting plus because so yeah. for us, it, it yeah. is you know, we pay an extra £100 a month than we did when we rented. But we own part of it so it is like i'm the first time i paid my mortgage it felt like an investment because it was going to me and not to yeah. um and you get that security rent. don't you you're not reliant on the landlord as such well and you know it was a brand new property it's bigger and nicer and nicer area um and we can paint and we can decorate and we can do all the things that we couldn't um as as renters so for us it was even even just looking at it as i'm renting but I can do more with my home and a part of my rent goes into a savings account to an extent yeah. is kind of how you yeah. can look at it. Um, and yeah. I think sometimes just taking away the idea that you have to do it one way and other ways are less um, really did sort of get me through that. But um, I was going to just put a very quick poll um, about whether or not you're receiving any, uh, whether you're planning to receive any financial support. So we talk a lot about um, the bank of mum and dad and gifted deposits and things, um, which we will talk a little bit about, um, especially if you're buying by yourself. But um, it's interesting to see how many people are worried when they don't have that support. Yeah. So I'll just give it another few seconds. Thank you for these. These are really helpful to see what you guys think and where you are. Well, really oh, no, hopefully interesting for other people as well. Yeah. To see what everybody else is doing, because that's partly what you want to know, isn't it, as a first time buyer? What's everybody else up to? Because um, <laughs> not everybody has that bank of mum and dad. And to some extent, that's what help to buy is there for. It's saying for those people that haven't got bank of mum and dad, do you know what? The government will step in for you and they'll put that 20 percent deposit down for you, albeit for the five years. Um, and that's how I always saw the help to buy scheme was mm -hmm. um, very much for those people that, that hadn't got a bank of mum and dad to fall back on. Um, but can still save their um, save save up for their money. So I've just Should shared those results. Yeah. Um, so it's kind of like a split. It's quite an interesting split down the middle there in terms of yes and no. But the type of support is is different. So thank you for yeah. sharing that. It's really interesting. Yeah, brilliant. And you know, if you if you have to do this on your own, well, hopefully you can see now that it that it is possible and there's a scheme around to um, help mm. you. Um, this was just a brief point that we have a lot of support um, on these different things we've mentioned, including sort of the ICEs for savings, as well as what the schemes are um, and our first time buyer guys. So you can look into those a bit more if you want. So those will be in the PDF that we send. Yeah, lots of help. Yeah, on to buy on your own. 
So buying on your own. Well, that's uh, that's how I started. Uh, that's how I got the ladder in 1993, all those many moons ago. <laughs> and uh, so uh, one of the reasons it is actually harder to get on the property ladder is because there are more people like myself uh, buying on, on your own. But there are things that you can do. So, again, speak to a broker first. For example, your, your, your parents might not have banker mum and dad. Um, but they might be able to act as a guarantor. There are things called family mortgages that mean that they don't necessarily have to put money in, um, but they can they can help uh, they can help in some way, shape, or form. So that's one way of doing it. We've chatted about the government various government schemes that are available, um, and additional ones in Scotland and in Wales. And the way I got on the ladder um, was actually I bought with a friend. Uh, who I worked with. Um, and the reason I did that was you th like in the 1990s, it was the most affordable to buy a home. So why was I struggling? Well, because we were capped at three and a half times our income for a mortgage. We weren't allowed any more than that. And uh, I was earning 12 grand at the time and oh, I had a good job. So that was a good salary then. But the house in Croydon was 65,000 pounds, a lot more now. But that felt like a huge amount of money to me. So what I did was I bought with a friend and between us, we managed to um, the deposit wasn't as hard, but the mortgage was much harder to afford because although you got sort of a couple to two percent rates now, I think, uh, or maybe three at a push. Um, in at some days, and I, I was lucky not to pay this, but some people are paying up to 15 percent, 14, 15 percent interest rates. So we forget that the mortgage was very hard in, in, in the past, whereas the deposit was much easier and it's kind of tables have turned now. Most mm -hmm. important thing is have a legal agreement of what happens if you need to sell. You, you might fall out. Something might happen to you. One of you might lose your job. You might get into financial trouble. There's all sorts of things. Probably look at buying with two you, and maybe up to three. If it's more than that, it can be a bit complicated because not all mortgage lenders, as I mentioned before, mortgage lenders do different things. They will take everything into account. And you must check that everybody's got a good credit rating. Otherwise, if the person you bought with has a bad credit, rate, credit rating, that could affect you. And buying what we call tenants in common. So that means that if something happens to you, your share goes to your family or who you want it to, not necessarily to the other person. Um, which is uh, how it would work otherwise. And if you can buy a property, for example, uh, and you can rent a room in it, you can actually earn up to seven and a half grand tax free, depending on the local rent. So if you can afford to buy a property and it would be a bit of a stretch, but you've got that uh, extra room to rent, you could um, help pay your mortgage off quicker or just give yourself that little bit of extra spare cash by renting out a room. So that's another uh, way of doing it if you've, if you've got enough cash to do that, um, but you'd be worried about the ongoing costs. So there's definitely ways of doing it. I've done it before and it worked very well for us. Um, so my mate decided to get married and kick me out. So there we <laughs> I go. think that, that was one of the things nicely. people do ask, <laughs> you know, what happens when things change? And, um, you know, if you put an agreement in place that you, or at least you did, you know, if if they if they get a partner and they want the partner to move in, you know, as long as you work out in advance how how you want things to work, or even yeah. if you are gonna you're gonna buy and, and see for a certain number of years, as long as you've kind of both got the same um, view to it. Yeah, an outlook. You're right, actually. Yeah, which which we had, um, although she got married much younger than I did. <laughs> So reducing stress, um, there are ways of doing that. I do understand it's a stressful process. And the first thing that I'd say is that just our times, and you must have felt like this, Andy, where you just think this is never going to happen and it's just never <laughs> going to work. It does happen. And the only other bit I can add to this is that if every time I lost a property that I loved, I actually found a better one around the corner, sometimes literally. So don't lose heart if you do lose the property you love. Uh, there will be something better. So what else can you do to make your life that little bit easier um, if we go on to the next one? Mm -hmm. So do find out in advance what you need to do and when. Uh, and there's a great checklist on uh, really moving that you can use to do this and a timeline. So they have everything in. I've, we've been through those with a fine tooth comb. I don't know how many <laughs> times. So there's lots of useful information in there. Always create a file, whether it's digital or offline, having all the key things um, that you need to do because you will get a lot of paper Work. And when you buy a home, you'll need that paperwork to sell it. So don't forget that. Um, pay for a good service. If you go for cheap legals, your chance, in my view, of uh, the self falling through will go up. Um, and uh, you don't want that because that will cost you money. Um, 
talk to your broker about ensuring your mortgage payments um, if you can do that um, and always return the paperwork or make any payments if you can within 24 hours do not wait one to two weeks um, I had to buy a property once with a <laughs> buying it off an international lorry driver oh <laughs> my word it took ages he was like back one day in every month and he didn't <laughs> understand the paperwork and it was a nightmare have your money ready on time if not early and please just don't go on holiday it's my pet hate and it ruins my time frames so don't do that so hopefully that gives you some tips i would add as well in terms of preparation um making sure i mean when we do have guides on this and and if you guys are earlier in the process you'll probably be here while you're sort of saving and things but um checking your credit score in advance because oh, good one. You know, yes of course yeah our, yeah. Um, our first purchase fell through because of a, a random payment that suddenly appeared after years luckily at that point um not only did we then discover there was a whole cladding issue with the first property we were looking at wow. but then my partner lost his job doing during the lockdown so if we'd managed to move well, into that that's, property that's it would have been <laughs> it would have been a nightmare if we'd actually got it and then and I think as well we didn't like the area as much and we were just so desperate to move I think when you get that when you get geared up and you really want to go um it's hard to so pull back we were very lucky that actually sorted out the credit score worked on that got a new job and and it kind of we found a place that was much better so whilst it is stressful yeah. I would I would back that up but yeah definitely <laughs> always check your credit score <laughs> yeah that's there that's a really really good point so hopefully some good ideas of how you can uh, make life just that little bit easier for yourself but it is it is a big job you're taking on so we don't underestimate that um and um I hope that was of some help really because it's it's over to you isn't it Andy in terms of what else uh, really moving can do yeah, so this is just again a summary of some of the stuff we have, um, our checklists, our timelines, lots of different calculators. Um, we have an email series for first time buyers that, you know, help with savings, but also give you updates on prices in the area, changes in, in those kind of things um, and our saving guides. And also, so we have a chat box on the site and um, email that you guys can send to. So if we wanted your questions desperately today and you've really provided them which has been so so helpful and we hope we've provided some good answers but we are also available on the site whenever so if you do have a question and you don't know who to ask we are happy to answer it um i was just wondering i might just do one more poll before i say do we have any questions because this one is one that i'm really intrigued by and it did boost my decision to buy um, so I'm just asking, has the pandemic had an impact on you wanting to buy your home? And good question. Um, good question. Because, you know, is it that we've seen stamp duty? Is it more people are thinking about where they want to be if they're not tethered to, you know, having to commute anymore? Um, I'm really interested to see if if people feel like it's more possible now or not. Yeah, good question. It would be really yeah. interesting as well, longer term, to see how the pandemic and work, where people work, pans out and whether that um, enables people or and whether it encourages people. There was there's a whole thing about moving out of cities. We're not quite sure that's completely hit yet, um, but whether that I don't think we'll know probably for another couple of years, whether we're seeing long term change or just sort of mini spikes at the moment in people's um, change in behaviour, if you like. Absolutely. Okay, well, that was, I'm going to close this and you're going to love this. It's it's so incredibly relevant. 51 oh, to 49. <laughs> Excellent. I like that. That always gives us twice as much to write about, doesn't it? <laughs> so, guys, um, please, we're really happy to take any questions if you do have them. So just um, chuck them in the box. How, do, oh, how do we do that? Do we go in the, people go in the chat box? Is that how they do it? Yeah, so I can, they're being sent through now, so I can read a couple out. Um, so Catherine has said, can you kindly explain the reality around obtaining a deposit through parents' house, as in their paid off mortgage? Just wanted some clarity. Ah, uh, okay. So that's uh, down to the family mortgages. Um, and there are, a, there are a, several different um, versions of those. Um, and uh, they, so that's, that's basically how it works and it is genuinely you need to go and see a broker on those because I, I'm not a qualified broker so you have to if you go and talk to them 
uh, and say that your family has got a house, but they don't want to physically put the money in. Um, and if they've got an income as well, then there will be a way that uh, there should be a mortgage or hopefully there'll be a mortgage that will will be able to help and support you without them necessarily putting um, uh, their own cash in. You will still have to raise a deposit, so you'll still have to raise something. Um, but they're quite they've been going for a little while now. So um, they they've got some quite good stats on them because they have worked out very, very well for people. So um, yeah, but definitely do one called a springboard, springboard or something like that yeah they do yeah. a springboard mortgage but i think you have to put money in so some you put money in and they'll put it in some will put it into an account where they get interest on it um and um and then you can change it so um definitely go and talk to a broker and see what options are available uh, to you and your family one thing if you can is to try and make sure that um it doesn't class as a second home for them so you don't get caught in the neither side gets caught in the stamp duty payment mm. um so where you have to pay an extra three percent if it's classed as a second home but there are even ways uh, mortgages that uh, mean that doesn't happen because they don't necessarily go on the, on the um title i hope that uh, if that's a good quick answer um so we've got at what stage can you still back out from an accepted offer so if you are in Ooh. england and wales <laughs> right up until so, the end <laughs> yeah so right up until exchange it's pretty it's pretty um scary to be honest and certainly from the seller's perspective um so if uh, until you have exchanged you are not committed and you can pull out obviously you may lose some money um so if you paid out for your survey or you paid out some other fees and depending on the deal you've got with your legal company some will offer you a no sale no fee um but you need to check what the conditions of that are as well so you can pull up right uh, uh, to exchange i i don't recommend you do that What's the really worthwhile is doing as much um, uh, checks, doing as many checks on that property as possible um, before you make that offer. Um, and there's a lot more you can find out about a property today than you could uh, in the past. So um, do make sure when you make that offer, you are pretty committed to it um, and you only pull out if there's an absolute emergency, um, you know, or you ended up with a housing triple disaster of uh, job loss and cladding and uh, uh, and credit rating issues. So we've got um, how much an average average do surveys cost? So I feel like I can cover this one. But um, uh, yeah, you must have written about that <laughs> um, a thousand times. So there are two different types of surveys. There's a home buyer survey, there's a building survey. Um, building surveys are more in depth. They're for older properties. They're for ones that have either had a lot of work done or you're going to do a lot of work to. So the prices do vary on that. Um, for a home buy, you're looking at maybe the lowest, I would think, would probably be around 700 to 1,000, and then from 1,000 upwards for a building survey. They are absolutely worth doing because Every you're checking what you're investing in. If you're going to buy a house, you're going to spend all that money buying a house, but you're not going to check it um, in terms of there's damp, there's building issues. It, it's not worth <laughs> you know, yeah. it, 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 even if you get a survey that comes back that says there's nothing wrong with the property what it will do is tell you what work needs to be done over the next what mm -hmm. work needs to be done in, um, over the next five years over the next 10 years everything so it helps you budget so for example if you're buying a property and you don't know that it needs a new roof in the next 10 years and that's going to cost you five six seven or even eight grand or more um, then it is very helpful and when you own a property you've really got to understand how building works and that survey really helps you to understand the building you're living in um, and any issues you might have now and again just like a broker if you're going to live in an area for a long time, get a surveyor that you get along, get on with um, and use them for life as well, because they can be extraordinarily um, helpful people to you, just as good as a broker and very independent because they're one of the people that absolutely like a broker. They work for you. Um, they're not like the agent who works for the seller, um, etc. So uh, they really work for you. You can also use that information to renegotiate. So if it's a property mm. you really do love, but it's got some issues that need fixing, you can say, well, the surveyor has said, this is the amount of money I would have to pay to make these repairs and you can ask them to take it off and they might, I mean, if, depending on what the options are. Um, yeah, so true. would a broker be the best person to tell me and my partner what mortgage we could afford based on salary? Is there a calculator you would recommend to get us started? So yeah, a broker would be 
the right person yes. for that. So you can use the calculators. Uh, we've been chatting about this. The calculators online, I understand, are better. And I think you've got some, haven't you? Because you work with so Mortgage we work Advice with Bureau. Mortgage Advice Bureau. Um, you can go to reallymoving.com forward slash mortgages and you can find their calculator there if you want to. But they're also offering free advice from our site. So feel free to just call them and have a chat. They're really helpful. Um, yeah. So yeah, calculators won't give you that in, like you'll get a rough idea. But, mm. but it's always, I, from my perspective, yes, give it a go on a calculator. And if you can see, yeah, numbers seem to stack up, then go to a broker. But even if they don't, it's just worth double checking just in case there's something that the calculator's missed. It's that sort of computer says no uh, um, scenario. So uh, don't rely on everything that you can see on there because of course the market changes again. Um, so, you know, 95% mortgage le uh, lending will come back at some point. So um, either com the calculator is not going to know that. <laughs> there's um, there's a few more. We'll try and cover them all. But um, this one I think is really interesting because I think a lot of people are thinking about this as first time buyers. I'm not sure whether to go to push to the higher level of what I can afford and stay there long term or move, you know, move into something that's more affordable and then move again in a few years. Um, I'd Ooh. rather go with the high, what I can high, highest afford, but I'm not sure if it's if the second option the second, is better. Yeah. Okay. So um, this partly comes down to how you what what allows you to sleep at night, and that's not a trivial answer as such. But if you're somebody that is going to really extend yourself and worry about it, it's probably not the right thing to do. Um, and if, however, if you if you're somebody that can live with that risk, if you know you're in a good job. So if we talk about jobs at the moment, there are jobs that have survived the pandemic brilliantly. And there are jobs that clearly um, have just had the worst time ever. So if you are confident that you can always make that mortgage payment or there's a backup. And another thing you might want to do with that, just to give yourself a bit of reassurance is, um, have you sort of plan B with insurance just in case one of you get sick or something like that um, if you've extended yourself um, but the other thing is is could you let that property out if necessary so if you split up for example sorry to mention that it's a bit miserable but um, I best, I'm here to give you the best advice I can um, so if you split out if one of you gets sick you know um, sadly doesn't make it or anything then you can you can um, insure against some of that to make sure that you can retain that property. It's always about making sure you're never forced to sell. So that's what you've got to remember and staying on that ladder for 60 years, whatever property. So really, so the other option is, is would you have to do a lot of work? Because there's something like 400 rules and regulations to let a property. It is not a simple thing these days. You have to have electrical checks uh, from the end of March. You've got to have gas safety, etc. So if you're going to do that, I would make sure that I could let that property out and that that would cover most, if not all of the bills um, net of tax, which is also important to be aware and potentially talk to your broker and say, can you go with a lender that would allow you to switch to buy to let if necessary? So that's another question to ask of the broker that, you know, um, your plans, what your plans are. So what you want to do is to mitigate the risk of being forced to sell that property. So um, as I say, if you're somebody that would just worry yourself every single night, it's probably not worth it. But on the other hand, if you can extend it, you're confident that whatever, however much life throws at you, um, you'd be able to stick with it or let it out, um, uh, let that property out. And houses are particularly popular at the moment. Then um, you, you, you've just got to mitigate the risk and do what you can. Um, so, you know, and as long as you, it's like I said before, as long as you can still pay in that mortgage, as long as you're not forced to sell, then um, hopefully after five sort of 10 years, as we've spoken about before, you'll have paid down a reasonable amount on repayment, et cetera, um, perhaps had a wage increase at work, something like that. And could you get another job? Could you rent out one of those rooms? Um, so it's all about mitigating the risk and finding other ways of making money out that, that would allow you to always afford that mortgage. Brilliant. Um, so just a couple more. We've got, and we've got another 10 minutes, so we will try and answer as much as we can. But again, like I've said, if we don't answer them today or something appears afterwards, we will send you that guide and you can just reply to us and we will try and find the answer for you or direct it. Some of these things we'll we have written about, <laughs> <laughs> some of the things we have written about on our site. So we have had one about um, the best ways to investigate finding those good value areas you mentioned. Um, yeah. 
and if there's a property I like but I feel it's overvalued how can I find something similar so I think you did already mention if we know if you know the area you like and you could look a few stops further down um yep. you know expand yeah and while we're all the only exercise we can do is walking um don't <laughs> I, I know we're all in this digital age but there is nothing like walking an area at different times of day um obviously you'd have to do that on three different days so you're only allowed out once but um there is there is no substitute um i used to buy and sell with a company um with other people as well uh, it wasn't me personally 100 properties a year and um we bought them in and then we sold them straight back out it's called under a system called part exchange so we bought them in at a bit of a discount um and if we didn't sell that property out that we'd bought in in three months we lost money that's how sort of uh, scary mary it was really <laughs> so um but the one thing we always did was we visited that property and we really got to know that area well and we talked i, I just accost neighbors in the street and people and talk to them and find out about the area as much as i possibly could um and if you do that that's that's when you'll find the little nugget roads and like i say if it's an expensive area look at the areas on the edge uh like i did where you've got cheswick and ealing there'll be an acton in the middle of there acton's quite posh i think these days mm. now it wasn't in wasn't in my day <laughs> and taxes wouldn't stop in certain areas i can tell you so <laughs> it is about looking at those expensive and then just looking on the periphery um and finding a little close or a little place we found a, an amazing place in reading um in this really expensive area called early but on the edge there was just this tiny little um housing association with houses and flats and it was just a close of about 30 properties and because they were ex uh, council effectively you could get them for an absolute bargain um and yet you lived in this fantastic area <laughs> um so and the people most of the people were sort of on benefits stuff like that but they were absolutely lovely and we had we it was we loved living there it was absolutely fantastic mm -hmm. so don't sort of throw your assumptions away and get to know that that sort of area really well sounds good um so ah uh, will my lower earnings in 2020 impact my chance for a mortgage i'm self-employed uh, okay, so my understanding and this is obviously I'm not regulated uh, or qualified, so um, not really the person to answer this question, but I can tell you facts. Uh, so my understanding is that I've read lately is that there are so self-employed for people who are self-employed um, you I'm afraid you go in and out of favor if you like with lenders. So as soon as they see a risk list lenders are very risk averse. Um, they kind of just run away like they have with um, 5% um, deposits, which is which is such a shame because clearly um, so far there hasn't been a risk in that at all. Um, and um, what I would do is anybody where you've got a situation where you're self-employed, just go and talk to a broker. Let them take the responsibility. Let them take the weight. They need to understand your overall personal circumstances to be able to um, help you um and to find the right lender for you that's that's what their job is to do and to give you the best advice on that um so uh i can't give you a straight answer but i can tell you who to go to speak to to get one <laughs> brilliant um and then uh, can you share hmm, don't know i don't have any information you might you know everything <laughs> we'll um, see. can you share any information about the proposed changes to leasehold law and extending a lease Oh, I can. So um, the good news is that anybody that has a lease now and moving forward, um, things are going to get better, uh, to coin a very cheesy phrase. Um, but what I would caution of is it's going to take some years to do that because most of the changes are just proposals at this stage and the government is saying we are going to do this. However, um, that's got to be in a law change. So they've got to put it through all the legal process. So you're looking at least two, but you're probably looking at three or more years away um, to get the changes. So um, the two main changes that are going ahead, um, and if we haven't got something on this, Andy, we can, we can get this written, are mm -hmm. that when you look to renew a lease, and you typically, I think, have to be in a property, don't quote me on this, I'm pretty sure it's for two years before you can do this, unless you get a dispensation from the seller, um, you can renew the lease up to 999 years. That's what they're looking at. And they're looking at um, lower ground rents, which has sometimes been an issue in the, in the past. So the length of lease 
range won't be an issue moving forward as much as it has been now, where it can, if it falls below 80, it can substantially lower the value of the property because typically lenders don't like to lend on that. So it's only open to cash buyers. Um, the second part of it, which will actually be much more practical and helpful, again, it's not going to come in for a little while yet, is that they are fixed capping the price that um, leasehold packs can be sold at to buyers and um, they are limiting the time that it takes. So some freeholders are very, take a vet like weeks and months to get you those leasehold packs and charge you a fortune, and that practice will be stopped into the future. So um, if I tell you that I believe the Law Commission report on recommendation for leasehold changes was over 800 pages, I kid you not. Uh, I've distilled that down into <laughs> two minutes. Uh, but there, there is a lot happening. It is good news, but it's not going to happen anytime soon is what I would say. Um, the good news is, though, is what's happening with new build developers. Some of the good ones, they are already selling new build developments on 990 year lease with a zero ground rent. So if you're looking at a flat which is 125 years and ground rent versus one which is 999 years and zero ground rent, then um, you know it'd have to be something special not to not to take the the better leasehold deal. Brilliant. Well, I think there's a couple more questions, but we we will try and um, email out in the PDF. We'll answer some of those as well. So if we haven't answered them today, they will be in the pack that we're sending out in the next few days. Um, as mentioned, we're on socials, send us a question, email help at reallymoving.com um, and, you know, have a look around the site. We're here to help. That's exactly what we're here for. So thank you very much to Kate. Thank you to all of you um, and for sharing your questions and your insights in the polls. Um, and if there are more things like this that we could run to help you, then please let us know. All right. Thanks so much. Brilliant. Cheers, everybody. Bye.